The show discussing problems and issues of health with Dr. Alcena. For this segment of the show, I'm going to continue to talk about high cholesterol. High cholesterol is extremely, extremely common. 106 million, 700,000 folks in this country have high cholesterol. And high cholesterol develops as a result of a genetic abnormality uh, that is inherited from parents to offspring. The abnormality is located on the long arm of chromosome 5 and it gets transmitted to the individual, to individuals, and then what occurs in the, in the, in the bloodstream is a substance called, called coenzyme A. The coenzyme A becomes overactivated, resulting in overabsorption of uh, cholesterol. So therefore, once you overabsorb it, the level becomes too high, and some of it wind up staying inside uh, blood vessel and particular arteries, and then form clot plaques. And the plaques then damage the vessel, causing it to become narrowed. And the narrowing of the vessel can lead to strokes, heart attack, kidney failure, eye problem, etc., etc. So that's the bottom line. When I left off last week, I was talking about the effect of aspirin. Why is aspirin so important uh, to be used, as well as can be very dangerous if individuals have abnormal bleeding problems that can cause them, the aspirin can make them bleed more. Even individuals who don't have an underlying bleeding problem, if you take too much aspirin, the aspirin itself can irritate the stomach and the irritation of the stomach can lead to ulcers and ulcers of other abnormalities resulting in blood loss, etc. So you have to discuss you're taking aspirin with your healthcare providers so that they, he or she will then advise you after evaluating you to see if you are really suitable to take aspirin. Aspirin is a fantastic medication. I take one, 81 milligram every morning myself, and it can do, it does a lot of good. Now, in terms of the aspirin, there's several things when you have elevated lipid, be it high cholesterol or high triglyceride or low HDL. Those are the abnormalities, high LDL as well. So what happens is that the aspirin prevents uh, uh, clots from occurring by rendering platelet qualitatively abnormal. Therefore, the platelet cannot aggregate. That's one way. The next thing that the aspirin does, which is super good, is that aspirin prevents the development of local inflammatory processes. In order for, for a plaque to develop, the first step in the development of the plaque, no matter where you're going to develop the plaque, is started with an inflammatory process. The inflammatory process damages the, the first lining of the vessel called, called the lumina. That then, uh, I'm sorry, called the intima and then the intima is now damaged. Because it's damaged, plaque can develop because the inflammatory, local inflammation is allowing garbage to be piled up in the damaged area of that vessel, and then garbage piled up on top of garbage, and you wind up with a formation of plaque. That's the process. So aspirin is very good in preventing plaque in the vessels. Also, aspirin is excellent in preventing the development of things such as colon cancer, because for you to develop a colon cancer, you have to have a polyps. Well, aspirin can prevent the development of the polyps, unless, of course, you were born to have hereditary polyposis, which is a completely different situation. Other than that, so aspirin and NSAIDs are very good, but both NSAID and aspirin can be very good. They can also be extremely dangerous. Because as I mentioned last week, there are many, many conditions. Among them is, of course, Van Willebrand disease, which is a qualitative platelet abnormality. 3.2 million people in this country, which is about 1% of the US population, have Van Willebrand. And there are many of them don't even know they have it. Until something happens, they start bleeding. Doctors try to stop the bleeding, they can't, and they suddenly begin the evaluation, they realize that they call the hematologist to evaluate it, they found out, oh my God, they have a disease. 
across the world, you have 7.7 .7 billion people. And 1% of that, if, I, if my math is correct, is 77 million people with von Willebrand disease, which is 1% of the world. That's a lot of folks. On top of that, you have people who were born with hemophilia that they knew since childhood. They know about it. And of course, these people know they stay away from NSAID, they stay away from, from aspirin. But there are a lot of other folks, many people, many, many people develop hemophilia spontaneously during lifetime. They know nothing about it. I have diagnosed many such patients in my hematological practice over the years who had no clue that they had an abnormality until I have to screen them, as all of us do, make sure they're not going to bleed excessively during surgery. Then you find out that either the PT is abnormal or the PTT is abnormal. That's when you raise the red flag, you evaluate them, you find, oh my God, they have all these problems. Okay. So it is very important. On top of that, as I mentioned last week, everybody who have end-stage renal disease have a qualitative platelet problem. You say, well, how so? Well, the kidney is there so to produce a lot of stuff, different hormones. Also, the kidney is there to get rid of a lot of toxic material, waste material, to get them out into the urine. Well, if the kidney function is abnormal, the kidney, you, you are not able to get rid of certain substances. That is the job of the kidney to do. Those substances can piled up on top of the platelet, rendering platelets to become qualitatively abnormal. I mean, I can go on and on and on and give you example of things that, that can cause people platelet to become abnormal. People walk around with ITP. They don't know they have ITP unless the platelet was low enough they bleed spontaneously or stop bruising. That's when they get evaluated. A lot of people are walking around with low platelet. And if your platelet is quantitatively abnormal, well, now you're going to take aspirin. Inevitably, when you take aspirin, as I sit here right now talking to you, I have man-made Van Willebrand disease because I took an aspirin today. OK, so this stuff is complicated, and it is fascinating. But you have to understand, let's take a look at the rest of the world. What is the cheapest medication, pills, that people across the world, especially in the developing world, have access to to treat their aches and pain? Aspirin. They just take it. What is the cheapest medication these people use across the world when women are having menstrual cramp? Aspirin. And guess what? 25%. In this country and across in the developed world and under the developed world, under underdeveloped world, 25% of women who are having excessive menstrual bleeding have Van Willebrand disease. They know nothing about it. How about that? And these people have fibroids. Yes, fibroid can cause you to have, but they also happen to have Van Willebrand disease. 25%. That is a very large number. Very high number. And yet, this individual take the aspirin, because the aspirin not only is a pain killer, it's a pain medication, it's also anti-inflammatory medication, and it can prevent you bring your fever down. And when the uterus, when a person, when a lady is menstruating, the uterus is contracting. The contraction of the uterus causes a vasoconstriction, and I just finished telling you, there's a mechanism through which the aspirin can help to prevent that from occurring. So the, for many reasons, the aspirin relieve the pain. And that's, besides that, what choice do they have? That's what they have access to. You don't need a prescription to buy aspirin. In these countries, and for that matter, up until a few years ago, you also had to have prescription to get NSAID. Even now, there's certain NSAID, you have to have prescription to get them as well. So it is okay for me to sit here and tell you all this stuff, but when you are living in a situation where that is all you have access to and you are having pain, you're having fever, uh, what can you do? That's what you do. You have rheumatoid arthritis or you have osteoarthritis for that matter, which is even more common than rheumatoid arthritis. That's what they have access to. They don't have the money 
and they don't have the facility to get all these other fancy medication like we use to relieve pain. They don't have access to endocin. They, don't ha they just simply don't have access to these things. So what do they take? They take aspirin. So it's a fantastic medication, but you have to be super careful so that you don't get hurt by it. So therefore then, the aspirin in the setting of high cholesterol is super important because it prevents the formation of plaques. And I just explained to you how that process begins. Super, super important. And then if you do have proven cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, aspirin is also very important. If you're having a stroke, you're showing to the hospital, to the emergency room, there are many things we could do. We could give you TPA to dissolve the clot, or we could give you aspirin to dissolve the clot. The, the point I made last week in the last week's show, you don't need to give too much aspirin. It ain't going to do any good because there's only so much you could disaggregate the platelet. 81 milligram already did the job completely. There's no more platelet left to be disaggregated. So why giving the excess aspirin? What it is you're trying to achieve? You're just going to cause bleeding. If you could show me on the blackboard how you're going to give two aspirin and it is better to disaggregate platelet versus 81 milligram, I'll tell you, you know what? Here's this book. Take it. I'll give you a copy of it for free. <laughs> okay? It ain't going to happen. You can't just do things because people do it. That's really should not be the standard of practice because when you are called to the carpet, and I don't know of any, 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 I practice medicine in Westchester. This is my 41st year. And as a man of color, I don't know anybody who have been called to the carpet more than I have because I didn't belong here. So I had to be challenged. The problem is the people who are challenging me, who are still challenging me, don't know a third of what I know. So they're wasting their time making themselves miserable, causing themselves to become aggravated, and they're wasting their time. So therefore, when they challenge me, they're just wasting their time. I'm not perfect, but when it comes to these folks, forget about it. I feel sorry for them. I mean, it is sad to say that, how do you feel sorry for somebody who's trying to hurt you? I do because I'm a God child. God has been so kind to me so kind to me, so therefore I have a responsibility for the rest of my life to continue to be kind to people. Even those who did everything nasty and dirty and frankly borrowed and uncriminal to me, I still pray for them. I still do. Because that's the way God created me and that's the way I am. So therefore then, cholesterol is a very important substance but it can also be a very damaging substance. We say, well, how can something be damaging to the body and yet extremely important as well? Well, we wouldn't be adults, or we wouldn't frankly be born were it not for the help of cholesterol. Well, you say, how so? Well, because in order for us human beings to be born, to be, to be able to grow in our mother's womb, to have grown in our mother's womb, we need a hormone. Different types of hormone has to work together so that we can develop properly. Well, you say, well, what relationship does cholesterol have with hormone? A hundred percent relationship, because all hormone, regardless of what it is, the first step in the formation of that hormone is the cholesterol ring. That's right. It is the cholesterol ring that you attach to it different others chemical substances that form one hormone, another hormone, and so on and so forth. So we can't function. How are you going to, where are you going to get the, the estrogen from? Where are you going to get the thyroid hormone from to grow, to have grown in our mother's womb if we were in for cholesterol? However, it is when the cholesterol is elevated, it's got the problem. But all of us need cholesterol because all of us, men or women, infant, growing children, all of us need hormone in order to grow. A man couldn't function as a man, as a male, without testosterone. Well, testosterone couldn't be without the 
the cholesterol wing. Estrogen couldn't be without the cholesterol wing, so women couldn't be women, and so on and so forth. So uh, you, I'm probably sure you never either heard of these things before, but th this, is, this, is, this is the truth. So it is only when the cholesterol is too high that's the problem. And the too high cholesterol, as I mentioned, is, an ab is a hereditary abnormality inherited from parents to us offspring. It is located in the long arm of chromosome 5. That's the abnormality. And then that then causes the, the enzyme called coenzyme A. Let me give you the actual names of it so that you, you, you understand the name of it. It is hydroxymethyl glutaryl CoA reductase. And I call it coenzyme A to shorten it. And that's, that's the substance that becomes overactivated, that causes to overabsorb cholesterol. So when we eat cholesterol in our food, it gets absorbed to the stomach first, and then the small bowel, get into the bloodstream, okay? There, it's gonna do its thing. It stays in the circulation. The idea is to use some of it for our benefit, the rest of it to get rid of it. To get rid of it, it goes into the liver, get mixed with the bile, B-I-L-E, and then it get taken out into the stool. That is why the stool, it's a combination of the cholesterol and the bile, the bile that makes the stool brown when we have a bowel movement. However, when you have this abnormality, that coenzyme A become overactivated, you're overabsorbing too much cholesterol, the, 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 the system is overwhelmed with fat. And on top of that, if you eat Number one, a fatty diet. Number two, a diet that has too much uh, simple carbohydrate. And all sugar containing material, be it a drink or a food, is filled with simple carbohydrate. When you're taking the simple carbohydrate, by necessity, some of it is turned into immediate energy for us to survive. The rest of it is, is taken to the liver. The liver breaks it down. Some of it is turned into fat. That fat goes into the soft tissues, and the individual in question become overweight or obese, and the rest, unfortunately, sits inside the liver. The liver cannot distribute all of it. It's too much of it. That then damages the liver. That's why. Right. That is why the number one cause of cirrhosis of the liver throughout the world happens to be obesity, that's why, because the excess fat sits inside that liver, damages the liver, because everything that sits anywhere in the body must degrade. As it is degrading, it's releasing free radical. The free radical causes a local inflammation. That local inflammation begins the process of inflammation inside the liver or any other tissue for that matter, but I'm talking about the liver. That begins the process of cirrhosis. There are many, many things that can cause cirrhosis of the liver, from hepatitis to alcohol abuse to iron overload, excess iron, a whole bunch of other stuff. But obesity happens to be number one. And which country of all developed countries in the world has more obese people than anywhere? The United States of America. So. I mentioned last week how we go about treating. First of all, uh, 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 you have to understand, diet does not cause high cholesterol. It just makes it worse. So it's very important to eat a diet that has low simple carb, low fat, and low salt. Low simple carbohydrate, low salt, low fat. Those are the key to get to not to get fat and obese, or whatever you want to call it. However, a good diet has a lot of complex carbohydrate, a lot of protein in it, okay? And all complex carbohydrates are good for you. It's good because it satisfies hunger, because you're hungry, that's why you're eating, and it allows you to have immediate, short-term energy to, to, do your, to survive. That's all it does. It cannot be broken down into fat. And I mentioned, give you an example of, simple, of complex carbohydrate, pasta, spaghetti, 
plantain, yam, potatoes, all these things are good for you. They're not going to get you fat. They can't. There's no way they can because they cannot be broken down to the finite part and to simple sugar. They cannot. Only simple sugar can be broken into fat to get you into trouble. Now, I'm sitting here. It's easy for me to talk because that's what I choose to do and I'm a medical educator. But I happen to know the reality of it. Folks eat what they can afford. Folks eat what they have access to like I used to. When I came to this country working in a factory for a dollar an hour at Ace Goodman and Son in that Manhattan Industrial Center, when you're driving to the West Side Highway, that's the building I was working in. My food was basically American cheese, Kool-Aid, and Wonder Bread, okay? And then before I went to school at night, I used to have a thermos that I used to boil chicken Chicken back, the cheap stuff that you buy, chicken back with a little bit of fine spaghetti, put a little salt and pepper in it, boil it, put it together, and dump it into the thermos. And that was my dinner before I go to school. After I remove that dirty clothes, washed up, sit there, eat a little bit of that, put the rest of it into the, the valleys that I was carrying, head toward Washington Irving Evening High School. Okay, so. And believe me, believe me, I know what poverty is. It's nothing to be proud of. It's nothing to be ashamed of either. But no one at the time that I grew up were poorer than I was. So when I talk about these things, I'm not pontificating. I experienced poverty, the worst time you can possibly imagine. So therefore, then, I know that folks eat what they can afford. You know, I'm not here to badmouth anybody's food because this is a free enterprise system. People, you know, I'm a capitalist myself. People sell the product and people eat the product. They eat what they can afford. People are working two, three jobs. They still cannot afford anything better like I used to. When I went to college, I worked three jobs. So when I went to medical school, things were so bad for me the first couple of years of medical school. You can't make this up. The first two years of medical school, as competitive as my class was, I, I worked. That's right. The first two years of medical school, I worked at Jacoby Hospital in the blood bank, and I worked at the Einstein Laboratory, the Einstein Hospital Laboratory. That's right. And I had to compete. Because my class, 20% of my class were MD, PhDs, okay? You can get 90% on an exam in my class and fail, because it was a curve, okay? And I had to survive that. So nowadays, when the young people say, listen, I have compassion for you, I'm empathetic to your situation, but don't give me excuses, because I've been through that, <laughs> okay? So in any event, uh, 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 all I can say to you is that when you are taking those medication, the Lipitos, the Simvastatin, and all these other medications that the doctors prescribe to you, make sure you take them at night. Because the way God created the system, our fat level is highest at night, and also is highest after we eat our supper. So therefore, if you take this pill, as expensive that they are, you take them during the daytime, or in the morning you're wasting your time, it's not going to work because they don't have enough fat circulating to block. So if you understand that, and I'm sure your healthcare practitioner explains that to you, that is the reason why it's best to take your medication for cholesterol and triglyceride half hour after dinner or put the little bottle on your bedside table so that before you go to sleep at night, you take the pill and get some water and drink it. Then you're doing yourself so good. If you take it during the daytime, you're wasting your time. When we are giving those pills to an individual, we check their lipid profile every two months, and we also check the liver function test every two months. 
because some of these medication can cause the liver function test sometimes to become elevated. You don't necessarily have to stop them, you have to cut them down, cut the dose down if that happens. Another side effect, sometimes you could have muscle cramps. Yeah, they can call muscle cramp in some instances. So when they do, if they do, then we check the the creatinine and phosphokinase, the total CPK, the different types of CPK. We tell the total CPK, and if the CPK is elevated, then we have to back off from the medication because elevated CPK can damage someone's kidney. So that's what we do. We, we, we don't check the CPK every two months. We just check the LFTs and the lipid profile. That's what we do every two months for somebody who's taken this medication for lipid abnormality. We must do that. And if the person complains about feeling cramps and aches and stuff in the leg, then at that time we begin to worry that they may have muscle damage because of this medication. So then we check the total CPK. If it is elevated, then we take action to change the medication or do other stuff. But if it is not that, then of course there are many, many things that can cause somebody to have cramps and Pastiges of stuff in the leg and so on and so forth. So then, so that's what we do. So now you understand, and of course, a diet is key. It is my role to tell you about diet. Even though I know many people simply cannot afford the kind of diet that I'm talking about. And when you are hungry, my friend, you want something to ease that pain. There are very few pain that I'm aware of that is more discomfort than hunger pain. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about, okay? Because I suffered with such hunger pain for so many years in my life. So do what you have to do to eat some fruits and vegetables. Eat couple complex carbohydrate. Do not put a lot of other fancy stuff in it because the complex carb is, you need the, the, the minimum to make it taste good. Don't put a lot of stuff because you're spoiling it. The good stuff is the pasta. The good stuff is the uh, spaghetti. The good stuff is the, uh, the, the, the plantain. Don't put a lot of other stuff there that's going to mess it up. Find other ways to make it tasty. Put some seasoning or whatever so that you don't eat too much fat and simple carbohydrate that's going to turn into fat and make you sick. Listen, I'm going to stop here. This is the last show on high cholesterol for now. Until I see you again, this is Dr. Alcina saying so long and bye-bye.